Welcome back to New Households Sold. Today we're talking about flooring. As a design element and as a subtle design element, I think it's actually one of the most important decisions you can make because if you really want a new house with an old soul, getting the flooring right is really key. How do we do that so that it works? series hosted by Brent Hall new house old soul sponsored by stellar floors and the Unico system It really takes a study of historic floors to really understand why it matters in a new house. For instance, when we did that Pennsylvania farmhouse, we used Eastern white pine. Why? Well, because Eastern white pine was the wood that would have been used up in the Northeast because most of their wood up there was Eastern white pine. Now, as industrialization and the railroads and everything else begins to take hold across the country in the 1860s into the 1890s, you begin to have products from other parts of the country ending up in other places. But until that time, you know, you didn't have Vermont slate in Texas, right, in the 1800s. It wasn't until after the railroad that you began to see this transfer of material. So the story that you're trying to build, the story that you're wanting to use are regional materials. If you're out in California in the 1940s, the 1920s, you're building with redwood, right? You're building with these excellent, excellent woods out there, not the floor for the exterior trim and things like that. And so there are regional woods that, that happen historically that I need you to keep in mind. This is post industrial and this is pre industrial. So probably around, let's say 1850. Okay. Um, in, in that range, as industrialization takes over, around this time period, we switch over from a handmade era to a machine-made era. Now, what that means is, is that a colonial house that we're trying to build means that the flooring is going to be random widths, okay? And it's most likely wide boards because what would have happened is, is they would have taken a tree, right? And they would have cut the tree and they would have sliced it out of that tree and so you get, you know, some boards that are 8, 10 inches and some boards that are 14, 16 inches, right? Depending on the tree and everything else, because they would have taken the fastest time, the, the quickest way to get flooring material made. And because Eastern white pine trees were really big, huge trees, you end up with pieces of flooring sometime in historic houses that are two feet wide okay so in order to get a big wide piece of white pine today it takes a lot more work the other thing that would have happened is that they would have felled this tree and this tree was 20 feet long so every one of those pieces of board would be a 20 foot length that means when you lay lay in your room out and you've got a, a 14 by 16 room every board goes across that whole room there is no breakup i mean if you look at this floor right here right this is a maple floor in a warehouse look how short some of these pieces are i, I look at that i mean that's you know four inches six inches 10 inches and what happens is during an industrial era right you have them cutting knots out and on nicer houses there's a minimum length of wood that that's acceptable maybe it's 18 inches maybe it's two feet you don't see in normal houses four inch pieces of wood that's a cheap leftover and so in nicer houses you would have longer lengths realize that industrialization changes all that and so on our 1880s house down in Granbury all the floors are, are done like this there's no weaving in of the floors and so that's 1880 right and so as we as we think about these floors and we, we think about doing them we need to try to order longer lengths and get it right in fact one of the mistakes I made yes I make mistakes because I wasn't watching and didn't notice it until later was at the Pennsylvania farmhouse we had wide length white pine floors but we weaved it in and it wasn't until afterwards that I saw it I was like oh shoot we should have had all consistent lengths in that room 
not the end of the world, no one's gonna die, but it was a mistake. I remember when I was at North Bennett Street, we went to the Met, okay, and we were looking at the period rooms at the Met. One of the things my instructor talked about, they may have fixed it now, was that the oak floors or the floors in some of these early period rooms had floors that were weaved in. And he was like, they did that floor wrong. And so we were looking at that going, that's crazy that at the Met they messed that up. He goes, well, when they did those period rooms in the 40s, they weren't as sophisticated preservationists as we were later. We continued to learn new things. And so they had actually kind of done that period room wrong. And you can look if you're in New York and go to the Met and go to their period rooms and see if their floors are still messed up or whether they fixed it yet. I haven't looked in about 20 years. So some other things, okay? So not only in the pre-industrial era are boards wider, okay, and random widths, but when you cross over into this period, okay, and you get the, the post period, the early parts of that post-industrial era is that you end up with boards that are about five inches wide and fairly consistent. You know, the early industrial floors were kind of a standard width of around five inches. The, the standard two and a quarter inch, you know, strip flooring, which is what this is, and what most houses built, probably after the early 1900s, you end up with these uh, two and a quarter. So the two and a quarter strip, right, which is pretty standard, really starts about, you know, 1900, 1910, and lasts into today. The five inch, okay, and the reason why five inch kind of crosses over is because even in this period, even when they're just sawing logs this way, they could get a better yield if they could get down to a standard kind of five inch width and five inch dimension. So you'll see houses, our 1871 house had a mix of, you know, five, six, and seven, but most of them were around five. And so even in that, you know, pre-industrial era, they were still trying to get to that kind of that standard width. The other thing that happens is with big wide boards, even with old growth boards, is they can tend to warp and things like that. So five inches is kind of a, a nice thing. It doesn't move too much, won't cup too much if you do get water on it or it does get wet. And so, you know, you get into that two and a quarter, pretty standard. And then back here, it's all random, right? It's random widths and long lengths, okay? Over here, that is the worst writing. Long lengths, random widths, long lengths. <laughs> Over here, you get standard widths and short lengths, okay? So the next piece is wood type, okay? Now we talked about Eastern white pine in New England, right? In, you know, the South, it would be longleaf pine, okay? And so this same board would be a longleaf pine board. Now, the reason that's important today is because if you just ask for a pine board, you're gonna end up most likely with a longleaf pine board, okay? Or a shortleaf pine board, which is more available today to really get eastern white pine flooring or did e really get you know longleaf pine flooring you're going to need to be clear you're going to need to specify you're going to need to ask for that specific thing i mean a longleaf pine board is unique and is kind of definitive because it has a wonderful amber hue to it. The grain can be very tight if you get vertical cut. And so there is a distinctive character to longleaf pine that if you're trying to capture this old house, if you're trying to capture a Louisiana A. Hayes townhouse or, you know, some Mississippi Natchez Valley kind of thing, you know, you need longleaf pine. So you really do need to get geeky, right? You really do need to get specific on the materials that you're ordering if you really want to get the wood floor right. And when we made repairs in this warehouse, we did it. These are maple floors. Now, maple floors were an upgrade over pine, but maybe not as nice as oak. Maple is a very durable, hard wood, and so it makes sense for a warehouse. And when we repaired that, we went back with maple. We're going to do some repairs on the other side of this thing. We're going to go back with maple. So specifying this wood, there are spots in our shop where we had, you know, when it was when we were manufacturing here, where we patched with oak and we patched with longleaf pine, and those those areas stand out. They just you, you look they look completely different. Difference. So if we're going to want a consistent thing, understanding wood type, understanding wood size, right? And that standard, you know, width and length, you end up with something that is cohesive and tells that old house story. Really guys, there's almost too much information here for this kind of length of video because there's so many different stories to the way wood floors are laid. You think about McFarland, that historic house here in Fort Worth, that's the 1890s uh, Queen Anne Victorian. It had what was called wood carpets. Now wood carpets were basically available in the millwork catalog, something that you would have ordered from, but 
each of those rooms had a different layout and a different thing and they would show up in rolls and be laid out they had a clear border that would have been made up into a, in a factory put on a you know linen backer and then shipped out in a, as a border and as, as as the main body of the house and so you can get into some really crazy oaks and walnuts and and crazy different woods in there as those textures and patterns change there's so many different things really what you need to do you need to be a student of whatever house style you're trying to build sanding and finishing floors was not something that happened until probably the you know 1930s at the earliest to 1950s and so up until then floors were waxed okay it's fairly new i've done i did a video on shoe mold i said no shoe mold is something that happens in the last 40 50 years and what wasn't as common back in this back period so speaking of floors we're not even going to get into marble but you know we did that marble floor at that conservatory that we did a video of recently marble is something if we were in europe right probably most of this conversation would be about stone floors, not necessarily wood floors. The other thing that makes it a challenge for this, this you know, getting your floors right, is there is so much being done with floors today, okay? The pre-finished floors, which used to be ugly, but but are actually fairly good right now. On our Highland Park house, we actually did pre-finished wood floor because the way they come together is really good. And so there is technology happening out there that they can paint a finish onto your wood floor. The one thing I would never do, probably done it once, but it is the hand scrape floors, okay? Hand scrape floors drive me nuts and hopefully this fad has finally passed and no one's doing it anymore. Certainly don't see it like I used to see it 15 years ago, but the hand scrape floors is an example of a designer or a decorator having a kind of a fun idea of wanting a rustic floor and scraping the hell out of it, right? And, oh, I've got this rustic floor. Don't do that, okay? And it's an example of how something can become a fad, okay? And something that can become very dated. The reason I hate those floors is that if you had a board like this, okay? There was, the, first of all, they scrape in it this way, which is, that, that never would have done. They would have always scraped it with the grain. And so you end up with all these bumps and bruises all over this floor. And no one ever in history left their floor like that. No one would have done that, okay? And so the fact that they left this floor so rustic almost kind of shows their hand of like, what are you doing? No, no one ever did that. And so there can become some very popular things. I know that the grays and whites are kind of, you know, losing their, their popularity and people are starting to introduce colors again. We're going to look at those, that gray and white era that we just came from and go, oh, yeah, uh, that was kind of crazy. And it influenced everything. There should be some timelessness is the point. We want our houses to be timeless and understanding the historic precedent, understanding how that works really can help your house get that old house soul and have that timelessness, which adds most value in my opinion and is the most beautiful long-term. What I wanna do now is I wanna take you out to the shop. We've got some samples out there and I wanna talk about wood grain. I wanna show you how important the cut of the wood matters and how that looks. Okay, so I wanted to show you some floors out here and then talk immediately about just the character of the grain of the wood, also the placement. I mean, here we've got a herringbone and a chevron pattern, you know, herringbone over here, chevron pattern over here. These are French styles that really can make a huge difference in a dining room or in some special place where you wanna really elevate something. But if you look at what we did here, and this is for that big European house we did, Notice what we did here, guys. We did antique oak, okay? So the reason you're seeing holes here where the nails went in and you're seeing check marks and knots and a little bit of wormhole here is because, you know, we wanted wood with character. We wanted wood that kind of told the story of this house. Now, look, look at the difference in this wood quality here and the grain quality, okay? So there's a piece of antique oak, okay? It's really wide. It's probably 10 inches wide. A lot of natural checks in it. There's wormholes in this. There's some wormhole right there. So, you know, tons of character. Then look at this, right? And there's a piece of very clear pine, okay? Now, they're both plain sawn, okay? That means you see the steepling in the grain of the wood. And so they're, they're both plain sawn, but because this is antique, okay, it has tighter grain. The tighter grain means that it doesn't show off that crazy pattern. So if we stain this versus staining this, this is gonna look not as wild, okay? So the cut 
cut of the wood is very important. Notice too that this is a this is on a, this is an engineered piece of wood, right? So they've taken that that piece of oak and they put it onto a piece of plywood. Now whether that's where that's really helpful is where you're putting wood onto slab floors, okay? Where moisture from the floor might come up and try to cause that thing to warp, or you're putting it in a basement where there's a potential possibility of some flooding or some water coming through with the heavy rain. So the engineered floor we really like with the wide plank oak because because it's so stable and it keeps the wood from cupping. So, you know, but look at the difference in the character of the woods. You know, this would be very appropriate, very, very cool in a old European house, right? Or an old, you know, that's French revival, Tudor revival, any of those things like that. This would be very good in a clean house, right? A very contemporary house, right? Where you're almost gonna bleach the oak so that grain doesn't come through. Again, all of the different qualities that we can, we can do. Look at this too, okay? <clears throat> two pieces of pine, okay? This is a piece of white pine. This is a piece of yellow pine, okay? Notice the grain structure. Now, this one is rift and quarter sawn, so you don't see crazy patterns in it. Look how even this grain is. You barely see any difference between the early and late growth. And that's really what those, those color difference are. You got early growth and late growth. You don't really see any of that. And so they're gonna tell a different story, right? This is gonna be much stronger on the floor, especially when it's stained, than this one. Now. The other thing, I did a whole video on staining, and I talked a little bit about dyes. Now, both of these boards have been dyed, okay? That means that an aniline dye, chemical dye has been put on it, and there's no stain, okay? Remember, stain is a pigment that, you know, you've got a carrier that moves the stain, the carrier evaporates, and you're left with pigment. It can cause the wood to get cloudy. It can cause the wood to, to lose its color. So, especially with, with the pines, they are very hard to stain. They get very cloudy. So you're seeing all the subtleties and all the, the changes that can happen just with picking the wood, just pick, doing the stain, and, and the story that can be told just by the wood type and character and cut that can drive so many things. Over here, we've got a parquet floor. Let me show you that. So again, being a student of history, we are gonna talk about this parquet floor. And the parquet floor is actually a floor that was done in France that was actually mortise and tenon together. Actually, there's pegs in this floor. So there's, there's a peg there. There's a peg where these things go together. And on that eclectic French house, we had a dining room and a study that we did in this parquet floor. And we varied the size of the parquet floor so that it would fit evenly within that thing. So this is a custom made floor that we did for that room where we were able to introduce this kind of customization, but following an historic precedent. So when we looked at the old books, we looked at the, the patterns and how they put everything together. We had a clue for how to build. I mean, pegging in the floors, especially like in the 20s, remember that 1928 period revival house, that house had a pegged floor. If you think about the Dilbeck house, that had a pegged floor. So, you know, the way they did their pegged floors, they had a Forsner bit that went down and, and did this perfectly round hole. Now, historically, those pegs are way too big, right, to be appropriate to this kind of era, but they're hearkening back. So there's all these different histories and all these different stories. If I'm building a 1920s and 30s house, I'm doing my pegging like that with the big round dowels, okay? If I'm doing a period revival house, I'm doing it more like this. And so again, I hope that you're seeing that on this wood floor thing, that's not just you have this much selection. When you study the past, you have, you know, this incredible fan of opportunity from rustic to really refined all by the type of wood you choose, all by the stains you do, how you lay it, what size it is, what, what you know, what length it is. All of these different things really help define that and give your house that old soul. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that episode of New House Old Soul talking about flooring. One of the products that I think is definitely worth your consideration is this new way of thinking about how to install wood floors. Basically, you have a system of solid wood lumber, right? And there's a unique clip system that you're gonna see here as I put it together, but I can get a pre-made, pre-finished wood floor that I could also sand and finish if I wanted that is removable. So this year they've come out with a new product called Silva, which is a 5 8 inch product, different from their 3 quarter inch hairling product. This is that. You got a 5 8 inch product, it still snaps together, it's still easy to install, the craftsmanship's still excellent, it'll last a very long time. The beautiful thing about this system is that it's a floating floor system 
that water gets up underneath it, water can drain away. I can replace individual boards if I actually had this board stained or broken. I can actually take this board out and get this working just like anything else. And so this is one of those products that high quality, high speed, high flexibility as far as being able to change out floors and fix things if you have you know a problem with your floor system so stellar floors an amazing product a great new system for how to think about hardwood floors about getting beautiful hardwood floors that comes in a number of different species and a number of different cuts so i can get a huge variety of wood floors very high quality solid wood solid lumber you're talking about a product that's a hundred year product you know when we're talking about new household so we're talking about craftsmanship and one way where you're not going to compromise and, and and have craftsmanship problems is with the stellar floor system because they actually understand fine craftsmanship this is a product that doesn't need to get nailed in place this is a unique and wonderful system for building that new house with an old soul solid lumber great construction great details check it out for your new house with old souls